I'm Joel Rutherford, and this is the carpentry class at Muscle Shoals Career Academy, and today we're going to talk about wall systems. Now, there are two um, portions of this lesson. Uh, the first lesson is to teach you about laying out and constructing walls, okay? Um, and, and this is going to be a hands-on portion of the lesson. Uh, there's also going to be a classroom and a written uh, portion of the lesson. Now, one of the things you need to know uh, when you're laying out walls is that uh, is the vocabulary. So we're going to start uh, by talking about some of the vocabulary of the parts of a wall. Uh, this, v this arrow is pointing to a block. And Blocking is nothing more than just a piece of wood that is nailed between framing members. You can see here that it's nailed between studs. This is a stud, and this block is between them. Now, most likely, this block was used for uh, cabinetry. Um, what what a, a common practice is to put blocking up between the studs in a kitchen. So when the cabinet maker gets ready to install his cabinets, he's got something to uh, screw them into. Uh, the next thing, the next component of a wall I want to talk with you about is a cripple stud. A cripple stud is a short stud, and it fills the place between a header and a top plate, like these, or between a rough seal and a sole plate. So these are both cripple studs. Uh, double top plate is uh, shown here. Uh, if you look below, this is the top plate, and these two by fours on top are the double top plates. Uh, these help to uh, connect walls uh, where there's an intersection, maybe at a corner or a T, or even where you have a long wall and you have to splice it in the middle. A header, this is a header. You can see the red arrow pointing to the header. Um, this is just a structural member, and it carries the weight uh, that that comes down over an opening, uh, and it helps to transfer the weight down eventually uh, into the foundation. Okay, the next uh, term that we want to discuss is a partition wall. Uh, partition wall is just any interior wall that divides the space between a building. Um, in this instance, this wall does not carry any weight. You can see here that there's no uh, ceiling joists that are sitting on top of it. So this is not a uh, weight-bearing wall. So it would just be referred to as a partition wall. If it carried weight, we would call it a bearing partition. Okay, next up, we have a king stud. And you can see this king stud right here. And it is just the stud that touches the trimmer stud and a wall opening. It runs from the top plate to the bottom plate and the header is nailed to it. Okay, here's a rough opening. A rough opening is essentially just a framed opening that is built to accommodate a door or window or it can be something else, uh, but normally it is a door or a window. Uh, here's the rough seal and it's at the bottom right here. And that, is, that carries the, uh, the weight of the window, and it forms the base for the rough opening. Uh, here is a picture of a top plate, I'm sorry, a sole plate running right along here. Uh, one thing that uh, would be good for you to remember is that if, any, if a sole plate comes in contact with masonry, uh, such as on a house or building where you have a slab, uh, it needs to be constructed of treated material. And it goes from top plate to the sole plate, right there. A trimmer stud. Now, a trimmer stud, uh, it carries the weight of the header. So you can see the trimmer stud right here, okay? The weight of the header and whatever is sitting on top of the header sits on top of the trimmer and the weight is transferred down to the foundation. A top plate, it's a picture of a top plate right here, and it just runs along the, uh, the top of the, the wall. And don't confuse this with the double top plate. The double top plate goes on top of the top plate. Here uh, are some components of a wall. Uh, it's very important 
that you uh, are able to name this, name all of the items on this diagram when you get to the test. Alright, corner assembly. Uh, normally this is called a corner post, but you can see there's a full length stud here, a full length stud here, and then there's blocking nailed between the studs. Uh, this carries weight, uh, it provides a place for nailing drywall on the inside and sheathing on the outside. The sheathing is just uh, some sort of plywood or uh, OSB, any kind of sheet lumber that's nailed to the outside of the building, whether it's on the wall or on the roof. Here's another way of building a corner. Uh, it, it saves a little material and it saves a little work to do it like this. Uh, in my opinion, it's not as strong as the other method, uh, but nevertheless, uh, some people use this method. Uh, a T-post is used to connect walls that form a 90 degree angle and what happens is this there, there's a stud here a full length stud here and then there's a block between them and this is nailed into this wall assembly okay and when this wall is built the wall comes in this direction uh, a stud is nailed on the end of the wall and then when you stand both of these walls up this is what you uh, nail them together with. Uh, here's a rough opening. Um, it's always built uh, a little bit larger than whatever it's care whatever it's built to accommodate. So if we had a six foot window, we would probably build this rough opening uh, six feet and one inch. And this will just allow us to uh, to fit the window in there easily. Uh, if we made the roof opening the same size as a window, obviously we wouldn't be able to uh, to fit the window in there. Okay, uh, roof openings can vary. Uh, it kind of just depends on what the manufacturer of the window recommends. So you got to be careful with that, uh, especially if you guys are ever working on a, a, a commercial building or perhaps a very fancy house that has some fancy windows, the manufacturer may have some uh, different recommendations and requirements uh, for the rough opening, but normally you can add one inch to the window size. So if you have a three foot window, you would make that window three feet one. Um, now the header size should always be equal to the rough opening plus the width of the tr two trimmer studs. Um, normally these studs are an inch and a half, so you would add three inches to the rough opening to get the header width. Uh, just remember this statement right here, that the width of the header should be equal to the rough opening plus the width of two trimmer studs. Uh, this is a built up header. This is the kind of headers that we built in, built in here. Um, you have a framing member here and then another framing member. Now, normally we don't put this little piece of plywood between them. Uh, normally it's not really a requirement, but some people do it. Um, now these built up headers can be made with two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, uh, just whatever. Uh, if you've got a greater span, in other words, a bigger door, a larger rough opening, you're going to have to use a uh, larger members to build this header. Um, wall framing. Now, on 90% of the building, studs are going to be spaced at 16 inches apart. Uh, there are some situations where you can put them 24 inches apart. I don't ever recommend doing that. I always use mine on 16 inches. Uh, now we use 16 and 24 inches because they divide evenly in 48 inches and to 96 inches and that 48 and 96 is the uh, The length and width of a piece of drywall or a piece of sheathing so that that's the reason for using the 16 inches and the 24 inches uh, use and, and what that does is that allows the uh, the ends of the sheeting or the drywall to always land in the center of the stud. Um, stud spacing 
uh, requirements are located in the drawings and specifications. So, like I say, 90% of the time it's going to be 16 inches, but there could be a time when you would need to check those drawings and specifications just to verify uh, that the stud spacing is 24 and 16. Uh, now, this, this, uh, this slide here is just here to illustrate uh, how that sheathing is going to hit in the center of the stud. Um, if, these were, if these studs were spaced at 36 inches on center, then you would have to cut every single piece of sheathing to get it to land in the center of the stud. And uh, just a little side note, this, these people are really putting their lives at risk right here. Um, they don't have safety glasses on. And uh, obviously this guy is right here at the edge of uh, whatever that is. And don't ever do anything like that. You could get hurt. Okay, here are the steps for framing up a wall. Uh, first thing you're going to do is mark the locations of the walls on the floor using a chalk line. And, and this is a, a good illustration of these guys holding this line and, and popping that line going down through there where that wall does. The next step in uh, wall framing is to mark the locations of headers and intersecting walls on the top plate and the sole plate and what we're going to do is we're going to lay these down side by side and mark them at the same time that way they are all you know they're exactly the same when you start building the walls um, anytime you're doing this though you always need to make sure that the top plate and the sole plate are different lengths because you don't want butt joints ending up being directly over one another now here's a good example of a guy that is uh, building these walls and he's got his top plate and his bottom plate. You can see they're laying side by side here and he's marking them at the same time. That way he knows they match. Um, now this, by the way, that's one way that you can mark a T-post and, and you can even see right here he's got the two lines marked for where this other wall will come in so it's a pretty good picture there all right step three is to mark the locations of the studs when the studs are 16 ounce inches on center what you're going to do is stretch your tape out across the length of the top plate and the sole plate and you're going to make a crow's foot uh, three quarters of an inch before the red numbers because the red numbers are on six, are multiples of 16 inches so you're going to have a, a mark at 15 and a quarter um, which is three quarters less than 16 inches. You're going to have one also at 31 and a quarter and 47 and a quarter and so on and so forth. And after that, uh, you will put an X and then you make you use your speed square to make a line across both boards. And that's the process of laying one out. Uh, here's a pretty good example here. You can see where he made this line at 15 and a quarter, right there, okay? You can even see 15 and a quarter is written there. And you can't, you can't see it because the stud is sitting there, but there would be an X right there. And what that is, is that tells us that that's where that stud goes. This picture here, he's done it um, at 31 inches. And it would be 47 and a quarter and so on and so forth. And that's how you mark the studs on a wall. Obviously, you don't put studs in a window unless you're marking your cripple studs, and you wouldn't put them in a door unless you're doing cripple studs. Step number four is to place the pre-assembled headers, corner posts, and partition assemblies in the proper locations. And you put those between the top plate and the sole plate. So you're going to go ahead, you build your headers, you build your corner posts, you build your T-posts ahead of time, sort of prefab those. So when you're uh, framing walls, you can just lay them down and start putting them together. Uh, normally what happens is the guys with less, ex less experience will be the ones building the T-posts and the headers, while the other guys that have been around a little longer are laying out walls. And um, that way everything's ready to go at the same time when you're ready to put the wall together. 
Uh, step number five is to put your studs at the right location using those uh, marks that we talked about on the last slide. Now, almost all uh, pieces of lumber are a little bit crooked. They've got a little curve to them. And that's referred to as a crown. So when you're building these walls, your crown should be all facing up. Now, if a stud is bowed uh, or twisted, you don't use it. If it's got an extreme crown, you don't use it. Uh, if they've got just a small amount of crown, we're going to put them facing all the same way and move forward from there. Uh, the next step is to nail everything together. If you're building a two by four wall, you got to drive two 16 inch 16 D nails through the sole plates into the studs. If you're building a two by six wall, you use three uh, 16 D nails. Now make sure that you are paying attention to this statement here. Uh, this is a little illustration of crowning. Uh, you can see that this board has got just a little curve to it and that's referred to as crown. As long as it's not bad, it's fine, um, but it's important that these always be facing upward if we're talking about rafters and ceiling joists. Um, if it's walls, we just all want them to be facing the same way. Okay, here's a block. Blocking serves two purposes. It stiffens the wall and doesn't allow studs between the wall studs within the walls to bow. Also, it slows the spread of fire. And this is known as fire stopping. So when you got a wall, I'm sorry, a block like this in your wall, if you have a fire, that wall, that block will not allow oxygen to run up between the uh, the cavity of the wall and it will slow the spread of fire so this is a good good reason for blocking and as we talked about before sometimes these can be used for cabinetry um, we would always put uh, blocks next to the toilet so that uh, when the, the owner got ready to install a toilet paper holder he had something to screw it to um, I, will, I always put blocking uh, where I knew a picture would probably go, like over a fireplace and a mantle. Uh, if you really start thinking about it, there's a lot of uh, instances where you can install a blocking that's going to make a building work better for the owner. And uh, as a business person and a carpenter, that's one thing we always keep in mind is our customers. All right, windows and door sizes. They're always stated in feet and inches. The width is given first and the height is given second. So if someone says, I need a 2630 window, what that means is that that window is two feet, six inches wide, and it's three feet, zero inches tall. And as I said before, the way you say that is 2630. Now this is an example of a uh, of a floor plan and you can see this window right here and it says 2630 okay this is a door and it says 6068 and that means that that door is six feet wide and it's six feet eight inches tall six feet eight is a standard height for a door here's a 2668 here's a 3068 door this window here is 6040. So that should give you an idea of, of those window sizes and how they work. Now, anytime you're roughing, roughing in a window, the rough opening is equal to the width of the window plus the thickness of the jam material plus the shim thickness. Uh, rough openings can be, be found on the drawings in the window and door schedule. And finally, another good source of window and door information is the manufacturer or window supplier. Uh, basically, what I would always do when I was building is if I had a house that had the standard um, vinyl windows, you can pretty much bet that you're going to add one inch to the window size for the, the rough opening. If you have some fancier windows, you need to check with your window supplier. Studs. Studs num normally come from the uh, lumber yard in pre-cut sizes. Uh, studs for an 8-foot wall are 92 and 5 eighths. Uh, studs for a 9-foot wall are 104 and 5 eighths. 
and finally studs for a 10 foot wall are 116 and 5 8 inches now i think that, that pretty much those are are available uh pre-cut from a lumber yard if you get above ten, a 10 foot wall then you're going to have to cut your studs on site and to calculate the length of those studs we're going to look at this next calculation okay so here's our first example uh, and what we're going to have to do is calculate the stud length for a wall that's got a 97 and 1 8 inch ceiling height the wall will have 5 8 inch drywall on the ceiling and it's going to have half inch underlayment on the floor and what underlayment is is this just basically another layer of plywood that goes down on the floor and a lot of times uh, this stuff is uh, purchased to be extremely smooth if you're putting linoleum down um, you you would have to put down a very smooth underlayment if you're putting ceiling i'm sorry um, floor tile down it's sort of like a, the underlayment is sort of like a concrete board that you nail down so you have to take all of this into account when you're calculating stud lengths. But again, we don't have to worry about any of that uh, in this, this calculation, in this example, because we know that our uh, seal, that our underlayment is one half inch right here. Uh, and let me also take a moment to point out to you that uh, this, this example, yes, this example is on your test. So for step one, we're going to add the ceiling height uh, to the thickness of the ceiling material and the thickness of the underlayment. So we take 97 and 1 8 We're going to add 5 8 to that and we're going to add a half inch to that and what we end up with is 98 and a quarter uh, So not take then we're going to take 98 and a quarter and we're going to subtract the combined thicknesses of the sole plate top plate and double top plate uh, and that is those equal to four and a half inches uh, so 98 and a quarter minus four and a half inches comes to 93 and a quarter. So our studs need to be 93 and a quarter. It's a pretty useful information to have, especially if you are building a house or building that has very tall walls. All right, here's an example of steel studs. Now this is not something that is normally that we see very often in our area. Uh, I, ha I have seen a house built with steel studs before, uh, but it's just not something that's very common, especially in this area. Um, so there's some advantages of using metal studs. Um, they're stronger, lighter, and easier to handle. Of course, this depends on the gauge. The, the thicker the gauge you have, the more heavy that the studs will be. Uh, steel studs don't warp, they don't split, they don't twist, they don't have a crown, they don't have a bow, and they won't burn. Um, but now don't, don't think that just because a house or building is made with steel studs that you can burn the, the inside and the outside and the steel studs will still stand there. They won't. If, if that did happen, the fire would be so hot that uh, the steel studs would lose their strength uh, and also it, it just it doesn't work that way um, now the main disadvantage of using metal studs is the expense they're very expensive uh, as time goes on uh, we we may see a day when uh, metal studs are cheaper than lumber so if we get to that point people will start using uh, metal studs instead of wood but we're not there yet uh, steel studs have pre-punched holes and these accommodate uh, piping and wiring so that, that's another advantage of steel studs uh, if this was a, a, a wooden stud then you have to drill holes for the piping and you have to drill holes for the wiring uh, sheathing I talked a little bit about sheathing before uh, this is a plywood sheathing here and it goes on the roof this is wall sheathing and it provides stiffness it makes the wall stronger all right now if we're going to apply siding and i'm talking about vinyl siding you can see it right here uh, then we have to uh, use a sheathing of at least three-eighths of an inch thick 
Now this is not normally a problem because uh, standard OSB sheathing is 7 sixteenths of an inch. So 7 sixteenths is a little bit bigger than 3 eighths, so that covers us on that. Um, if we're going to use APA rated sheathing, the nails are spaced 12 inches apart at intermediate studs. So right here, the studs are spaced at 12 inches. Um, around the edges, they are 12 in, uh, I'm sorry, 6 inches apart. So that's something to remember. The main thing you need to remember is that in the center of the wall, you don't have to nail them as closely as you do on the joints. Okay. Now, this example here is when we are nailing, a, building a wall, uh, a partition wall that connects to a masonry wall. Now, this is something that's common if we're in a basement, okay? Um, now, any time uh, that we do this, what we're going to do first is we're going to take furring strips, and we're going to nail them to this concrete wall. We may screw them to it, whatever we got to do to get them connected, to get these furring strips connected to this wall. Uh, furring strips have to be made with one by two uh, pressure treated lumber, and they're spaced at 16 inches, just like uh, a normal stud. Um, and the, the proper nailing surface is three quarters to one inch, okay? You need to remember that. Proper nailing surface for drywall uh, is three quarters to one inch. Furring strips must be made of pressure treated material. Remember we talked about earlier that uh, any time lumber comes in contact with masonry, it has got to be pressure treated. Um, all right, I wanna talk now a little bit about estimating. Estimating is so important. Um, if we don't have a good estimate, we're not gonna have enough materials to finish the job, and we're gonna to have to, to end up buying more material out of the profit of the job, which means we won't make any money on it. And, and uh, that, that's a good way to go out of business quick, and we don't want that. So um, let's, just, let's just start by working this little problem. Uh, I want you to refer to page 26 of module 26 in your textbook. Uh, if you look at that, uh, you'll see that there's a sample floor plan there of a little building. The building is 24 inches wide, 30 inches, I'm sorry, 24 feet wide, 30 feet long. Um, there are some doors and windows, and there are some uh, interior partitions. So we're going to talk about that, and um, we're going to come up with an estimate on this. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to calculate how many 12-foot long 2x4s are needed for the top plate, double top plate, and the sole plate. And all this is is a perimeter calculation. Two walls are 24, two walls are 30. We're going to calculate that out, and it gets to we get 108 feet. Okay, uh, but now don't forget the interior walls. We've got to add them. Now, this is a little confusing here. Um, one wall that runs all the way down the middle of the building is 30 feet. So that's pretty simple, right here. Okay. Now, according to the example in the book. There are two walls that are 12 feet. Um, now, if you look at this uh, drawing here, those walls are actually 11 feet, one and a half. They're not actually 12 feet. Um, so what I'm assuming has happened is that this, uh, the book have just rounded that 11 feet one and a half inches up to 12 feet. To be honest with you, if I was doing this to estimate, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, it's not gonna matter much on a small building like this, but if we've got a large building and we're rounding up that much on every wall or every other wall, then we're gonna end up buying a lot of extra material that we don't need. So I probably wouldn't do that, but we're just gonna continue on with this because it's in the book, 
and it's on the test like this, okay? Um, now, after we have added up our uh, partition walls, we got th 130 feet, two walls that are rounded up to 12 feet, uh, that's 54 feet. So once we add these two together, there is 162 linear feet of walls. Now, that's great, but we've got to multiply that by three because there's a sole plate, a top plate, and there's a double top plate. So 162 times three comes to 486. Um, now, the next thing, the last step is we're going to have to divide this 486 by 12 feet because what we've done here is we've calculated the total feet of boards that we need. Now, we know you can't go and buy a 486 foot board at the lumber yard. We're going to buy 12 foot boards. We divide the total length by the length of board we're going to purchase, and that comes to 40.5 40 boards. We can't buy 0.5 12 foot boards, so what we would do is we would just round that up and we would purchase 41 2 by 4s 12 feet long. So that's your answer. Okay, the next step is going to be estimating how many studs we need. Now, the industry standard tells us that we allow one stud for each foot of wall length. Um, even though our studs are spaced at 16 inches on center, we purchase one stud for every foot. Uh, this is going to give us enough studs to make corners and tees and um, cripple studs and trimmers and, and all of the components that we need to construct a wall. So we find the total length of wall uh, using the procedure from the last slide. We added up all the lengths of the walls and we got 162 feet. So what we're going to do is we're going to purchase 162 studs. You can do this same little procedure on a, a large house or a commercial building. Uh, you just calculate your total feet of walls and that's how many studs you're going to need. Pretty simple. All right, now as we work through this example uh, of doing estimate, an estimate on the headers, you're going to find that there's some differences in what this presentation says and what's in this book. Uh, there's some mistakes in the book. Uh, there's a, a, a section in here where a 2-6 window uh, is put down as 26 inches, and that, that's not the case. A 2-6 window is 2 feet 6 inches wide. All right, now, the, si the information that gives us the sizes of the doors, it may come off the floor plan or it may come off the door and window schedule. Um, I've built houses where I had a door and window schedule and the, the drawings were telling me how many doors I had. I never felt good about um, taking that off the schedule because I always felt like there could be a mistake on the schedule. And since I was the one that was buying the materials for the, uh, for the headers, I always went and checked the door schedule because I, I didn't want to spend, I didn't want to end up losing money on door headers. But anyways, we're, we're moving along. Um, the example in the book has the following doors. We've got four 3680 doors. We've got one 30 opening without a door. That's that's referred to as a cased opening. We've got four 4830 windows and two 2430 windows. Alright, so we're gonna start off with the door headers and we'll leave the window headers to last. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add five inches to the width of each door. Uh, so we got this, the reason you add five inches is because you've got two inches added to the door size for making the rough opening. And then you add three inches uh, to the rough opening for the part of the header that sits on top of that trimmer stud. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 
four doors, and we're going to multiply that by three feet six plus uh, five inches. Uh, and that all calculates to uh, 188 inches. Uh, we, we can't forget about our other opening here. Um, and even though it may be just an opening without a door in it, we're still going to add that same five inches to it. Uh, and the reason that we do that is because if at some point down the road the owner wants to put a door in this opening, we want to build it just like a, a normal door so it makes it easier for them when they do decide to add that door. Uh, so we take the one opening and we're going to multiply that by 3 feet plus 5 inches, and that's 41 inches. Now we're going to add these numbers together. And we got to multiply them by two. The reason why the reason we multiply them by two is because each header has two two by tens or two by twelves or whatever it is. Remember, if you remember the uh, built up header example that we had earlier. Okay, our next step is to uh, calculate the amount of material that we're going to need for window headers. And when we start with this, we're, we're going to refer back to uh, what we talked about earlier and, and discuss that there were four windows that were 4 feet 8 by 3 feet 0 inches. And then there are two windows by 2 feet 4, two windows that are 2 feet 4 inches wide and 3 feet tall. Uh, now, we're, we're not really concerned about the height of any of these doors or windows right now. We're primarily just concerned with the width. Uh, so... The first step is going to be to add four inches to the width of each window. This will account for the one inch that's added to the window size to make the rough opening and also the three inches added to the rough opening uh, for the part of the header that sits on top of the trimmer spoon. So we got four windows. We're going to multiply that by four feet eight plus four inches. That comes to 240 inches. And we got two windows that's multiplied by two feet four plus four inches, and that comes to 64 inches. Uh, add these numbers together and multiply them times two because there's two, two two by tens or two by twelves on each window. And the answer to all of that is 608 inches. Now the next step is to add the length of all the headers together and convert them to feet. So we're going to from, from when we calculated the headers for the doors, we had 458 inches. Uh, the headers for the windows was 608 inches. Add that all together and you get 1,066 inches. Uh, to convert it to feet, you multiply, I'm sorry, you divide it by 12 inches because there's 12 inches in a foot and you get 88.83 feet, round that up to 89. Now. The final step is to divide the total length of material needed by the length of stock that we intend to use to get them. And that's going to give us the number of boards that will need to be pur purchased. In this example, we're using 12 foot boards. So it's 89 feet divided by 12. We get 7.41. We can't buy 0.41 boards. We'll have to order eight boards. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, some alternative wall systems. These are uh, wall systems that are used in commercial construction. You're not going to see any of these uh, used in uh, residential construction. The first is a curtain wall uh, system. In this system, the structure of the building is made out of concrete or steel. Um, the exterior walls are made on off-site and they can be made of glass or they could be uh, some other material. But the main idea that you need to understand is that it's a curtain wall, meaning that the structure is independent of the exterior of the building. All right. This is an example of a structural concrete building. Uh, in structural concrete, all the structural members are made of concrete. Uh, each a uh, component co requires a construction of a different type of concrete form. Now, this is this is primarily uh, what carpenters do on these types of jobs: is build the forms. All right. Um, 
structural concrete has got uh, steel members uh, embedded into it, and this is re it's referred to as rebar, and that strengthens the uh, the concrete. Now this is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about tilt up construction, and what you can see uh, right here is that these guys have initially they've got a slab built down here on the ground, and now what they're doing is they are forming up. I'm sorry, they have already formed up another wall here and they're pouring concrete. And what we're going to look at in a couple of, in, in the, the next slides, is they're going to let this concrete uh, set up and let it cure out good. Then they're going to stand this whole thing up so that the outside wall is going to be made of concrete. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, this is common. It is dangerous. Uh, so anytime you're around something like this, you always want to sort of, stay back from the the wall when they begin to lift it up so here's an example of, of them lifting it uh they've got these guys up here that are about to put these braces into place they've got a crane back here that's standing this cured concrete wall up all right uh now we've we've talked about uh the process for uh standing up uh, tilt up concrete walls just know that tilt-up construction requires extremely heavy lifting. Uh, these lifts are normally the heaviest lifts on the entire job. So just keep that in mind if you're ever on a job of this nature. Um, another thing you need to keep in mind is that when you are um, doing tilt-up construction, the doors and windows are made by installing something that's called a buck like a window buck or a door buck essentially these are just wooden frames and they serve as concrete forms uh, just I just wanted you to get that one little piece of terminology of buck and that's it for this lesson so I hope you've uh, learned something from this lesson and I hope you have enjoyed it so thank you very much <laughs>